Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Uh, Marishe was a, uh, a postdoctoral fellow at the Norman Lear Center, and the paper that she wrote called The Future of Television is the most popular download from our site. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you for your invitation, for, uh, for being here. I w have to start with a confession. As I was preparing for my visit here, I found it challenging to keep track of all of the names of the new businesses in digital entertainment. Boxy, Roku, Voodoo, Hulu, Lala, Miro, Vuz. In my linguistic bewilderment, I was reminded of the story of Babel. Out of curiosity, I went back and reread it. It was not what I recalled. I had remembered it as the story of a people who were punished because they tried to storm heaven and challenge God. What I found instead was a description of the first entertainment business model in the history of the world. Here are the verses where the people of Babel describe their project. We can bring ourselves together, they said, like stone on stone, use brick for stone, bake it until it's hard, for mortar they heated bitumen. If we bring ourselves together, they said, we can build a city and tower, its top touching the sky, to arrive at fame. Without a name, we're unbound, scattered over the face of the earth. Their project is to achieve fame, a name, Babel, the first brand in history. The tower will be visible from far, far away. It will capture the attention of the world. It will advertise the genius of the builders. People will marvel, how did they do it? The answer is what the Greeks called techne, craft, and what we call technology. They knew how to bake bricks, how to cement them with hot bitumen, how to design a structure that would not collapse of its own weight, how to manage a huge workforce. If we build it, they will come. And if they come, they will spend money. Here's the business model. The company is Babel Inc. Its product is the tower. The tower is marketed to the audience. The audience's attention is monetized. God, of course, was not pleased. Not because humans wanted to storm the heavens. That's not in the story. It's because the humans wanted fame, a name. And in God's kingdom, there was room for only one name, one star. So he destroyed the project, not with an earthquake or a fire, but by destroying their communication. He baffled their tongue. If they can't network, they can't be in the attention business. Now, let's fast forward about 5,000 years. Another brand, visible throughout the world, monetizing attention. Before I went to USC, as Marishe said, I spent 12 years in Hollywood at Walt Disney Studios, first as an executive and then as a screenwriter and producer. Before that, I was a speechwriter in presidential politics, but that's another story. My years at Disney from 1985 through 1996 marked the end of the analog era in communication. I didn't know this at the time, of course. All stories are easier to tell in hindsight. The digital era that succeeded it is still unfolding, but today it seems almost safe to say that if you can imagine a technological innovation, it will one day exist. In fact, to glimpse the future of communication, it is not necessary to imagine anything. 
Professor Castells put it this way, the technological possibility of a global, quasi-ubiquitous, wireless broadband network already exists, thereby increasing the potential for multimodal communication of any kind of data in any kind of format from anyone to anyone and from everywhere to everywhere. It is the users of that broadband technology that I want to focus on. In the context of entertainment, they are the people formerly known as the audience. I want to look at what happened when the analog audience became what Professor Castells calls the network society. I'm going to call them the digital audience. It's a misleading term, I know. Audience is too passive a word for producer consumers. So forgive me for using it as a shorthand for who they or we are. The story I'm going to tell is this. The dramatic transformation of the audience from analog to digital has forced an equally dramatic transformation of the entertainment industry's business models. I'm going to look at two businesses that have already been devastated by that transformation. Music and newspapers. And at two other businesses, movies and TV, that are desperately trying to figure out how to prevent what happened to music and newspapers from happening to them. So who is this digital audience? How do they use media? The digital audience is interactive. Once they were the object of communication, now they're also the subject. The digital audience is creative. The consumer of content is also the producer of content. The digital audience is global. I'll be speaking about the US entertainment industry, but of course the media ecosystem is worldwide. The digital audi audience is autonomous. Uh, as, as Manuel and uh, Imatubeya discovered in their study of internet users in Catalonia, the digital audience says, I am in charge of my attention, not you. The digital audience wants choice. I construct my own basket of media content. I am the curator, the editor, the bundler, not you. The digital audience wants convenience. I will get content when I want and where I want, and I will consume and produce and interact with media when I want and where I want. The digital audience is social. One-to-many mass communication has become, in Manuel's formulation, mass self-communication. I would add that participation in social media has become a form of entertainment, no less captivating than movies and TV. There is one more dimension I want to add, economic but that is a battlefield. Optimists say that the digital audience inhabits a gift economy. Its practices include sharing and barter. Its values include trust and consensus. It is not opposed to the market economy, but it requires mutuality and fairness from business transactions. Pessimists say the digital audience is an outlaw economy. It violates copyright, steals content, and seeks revenge on what it regards as greedy corporations. In the middle are the anthropologists. To them, it's a tribal economy, a matter of culture. As Spain's Minister of Culture says, traditionally, in Mediterranean countries, it's hard for people to understand that immaterial things can be worth as much as material things. Perhaps all these are true. 
activated by different circumstances. In what follows, we will see that play out. The first entertainment business to have its business model disrupted by the digital audience was the recorded music industry. Here is the music industry's business model as it stood at the end of the analog age. A vertically integrated oligopoly of five record labels signs recording artists, bundles 12 of their songs together into an album, stamps them onto compact discs, packages the CDs in jewel boxes, distributes them to record stores, and sells them to customers for $17. Well, until the mid-1990s, it was a strong industry. Selling CDs was a high marginal profit business, and the labels controlled the distribution chain. But then, MP3 files began spreading on the internet in 1994. Two audio players, Winamp, and MPG-123 were released in 1997. The Rio portable music player came out in 1998. These technological developments transformed the audience. If the music industry had listened to its newly digital audience, it would have heard this. I want choice. I don't want bundled albums. I want individual songs. But the industry feared losing control over content and distribution. And they feared that the lower marginal profit on songs would eat into their revenue. So when the audience said, I want to be creative, I want to make my own playlists, the industry re replied, no. You must buy indivisible packages that we make for you. The audience said, I want convenience. Don't make me store these CDs. And don't make me pay for their manufacturing costs. All I want is files, just the intellectual part of intellectual property, not the tangible property part. But the industry replied, no, we're selling CDs, objects not files. The audience said, I want to acquire my music when I want and where I want. And the industry said, no, you go to the record store. The audience said, I want to share my files with my friends. And the industry said, do it and we will prosecute you. And so the music industry could not have done a better job of driving its customers into the arms of Napster when it came on the scene in 1999. When the industry saw Napster acquire millions of users, it might have told its audience, stealing songs is wrong, but you're online and we're going to follow you there. We're going to transform our business model. Instead of forcing a $17 CD down your throat, we're going to buy Napster and turn it into a subscription site or maybe a micropayment site. It will be fast, fair, easy, cheap, and virus-free. Instead, the labels shut down Napster's free file sharing and tried to shame their former customers into coming back. It didn't work. So then the industry felt forced to go online, but they proved that they didn't get it. By offering incompatible formats for music and players, sold with heavy digital rights management restrictions at exorbitant prices from incompatible online retailers whose stunningly brain-dead features, that's a quote from this article, earn them a place in the top 25 worst tech products of all time. Well, panic broke out. Instead of transforming their dying business model, the industry tried to prop it up by cutting CD prices at big stores like Walmart, which only further reduced their revenue. But then, in 2001, someone took